whether we all agree right. that. And you're leaving. Her. You're leaving. Way to go, Dad. Dad of the year. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the March 2, 2016 workshop of the Scarborough Town Council. We're having a workshop this evening on uh, the long-range uh, planning facility. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, the town manager to introduce this matter. Fine. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, about a year ago, we finally started to get serious about uh, our long-term facility needs. Uh, really, since the day I started here, all sorts of projects have been swirling around, whether it's a public safety building or a library expansion, and some lesser uh, projects as well, but uh, nonetheless very important. Um, and we really have never had a cogent, uh, clear plan in terms of articulating those needs and understanding where they might kind of cycle into the, into the whole scheme of things. Uh, the other thing that happened about a year ago is the school embarked in a civil process for their own purposes and I was part of some of the initial conversations and that really sparked my interest in getting serious about this. And so with staff's assistance, really working with the senior staff, we started to, uh, to tackle this issue, if you will, and decided to, at least to get it to this point, use it, you know, kind of go through the internal process to develop uh, uh, through internal means, if you will, um, staff input to come up with what our what we believe our operational needs will be going forward, um, and that's really what you see before you this evening. We have supplemented uh, staff input with some consultants' help to better understand uh, size of facilities and estimated costs. All those are very very tentative, but we've made the effort to uh, begin that process to kind of understand the orders of magnitude. Um, and there's a couple of pieces yet to go, but we really wanted to share this document with the council, get some input, share it with the public, and perhaps get some input there as well. And then at some point, uh, with that input in hand and incorporated, we'd like to come back uh, again more formally in front of council for acceptance possibly. Uh, but we'll play that by ear as, as we go. So as I normally do when I've got a challenging project, I turn to Dan Bacon to <laughs> uh, and Dan has really kind of uh, led this project, uh, working with his peers and the senior staff. And we do have a bit of a, a short presentation really just to guide our thoughts. Uh, here uh, it was sent out over the weekend, but we also have printed copies of the draft plan here and Dan's slides as well. Uh, there's some extra copies if members of the public want it. Uh, it is available online as well. So again, this is uh, kind of a staff-driven internal project uh, and uh, at this point, a product. And we're interested in uh, testing it and running up the flagpole, so to speak. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Uh, thanks, Tom, and thanks, uh, counselors. Um, I certainly play a big role in this process, but um, just as much the other department heads, uh, Barry Schaff of Water and Curran, um, was instrumental in this project particularly around cost estimating, um, and also the Long Range Planning Committee um, lended a, a, a serious hand. So it certainly was a, a team effort. And uh, the presentation kind of prepared for this evening is to try to stay high level, really to give you an overview of why did we start working on a facilities plan. Tom mentioned some of the reasons already. Um, the, the broad process we went through and kind of the general contents and the key points of, of the plan. I don't dive very deep, so I'm not going to talk about, you know, advocating for one project or another or got, get very deep into one project or another, but really just try to describe the, the framework and the approach taken. And then I'm sure um, this evening and in the future we can get into the details of specific projects. Um, so why a facilities plan to begin with? You know, Scarborough's been, I think as everyone knows, has been growing rapidly for decades at this point and continues to be. Um, we're one of the fastest growing communities in Greater Portland and also in all of Maine. And so there's consistent growth and development and, you know, frankly, changes in expectations around delivery of services by our taxpayers, by our constituents. Um, have been and will continue to put a strain on our existing town facilities. So we thought it's important to to plan ahead um, and to be 
right at the curve or ahead of the curve on this. Um, we think that having adequate and sort of cost-effective facilities are critical to, to serve our residents, to maintain the town, and, and to protect our residents, businesses, and visitors. So it's important to um, know where we stand in terms of our the status of our facilities. And we really think it's important to, to, to kind of plan out municipal facilities over the next 1, 5, 10, 25 years versus reacting to any one project that may be proposed to Tom or to the council and, and having to kind of deal with it a, more in crisis mode versus a planned mode. So the facilities plan, the way it's organized, um, tries to lay out a framework for how we can kind of space projects and plan for expenses and kind of moderate how um, capital projects impact the town's debt service. So rather than having a collection of projects occur at the same time and borrow a lot of money, rather space out the projects and know when the town will be retiring debt and can take on additional debt. So that's uh, a key element as to why to have a facilities plan and, and actually look out this far. Um, it enables opportunities for figuring out if projects can share space, can collaborate, um, can address multiple needs. Say there's a new building going in, what are other needs um, that could go in that same building? that could eliminate the need to expand the building that that facility is in today. So consolidation and, 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 and project sharing can really be effective and can lower overall project costs moving forward. There's also sort of a geography element to this where um, if there's a facilities plan, the town can identify future uses for town land. We have in, in some areas of town, we have um, excess land or unused town land that we should potentially reserve for a future use rather than um, rather than maybe sell it or, or use it for another initiative. So really to kind of plan out the town campus that we're, we're on but also plan out our other town properties so that we um, aren't doing something in the short term that inhibits something in the long term for facilities. The plan also tries to poke at uh, opportunities for partnerships. Um, later on we'll talk about sort of the needs assessment and in there there are some facility ideas or projects that may not be fully funded by the town. Maybe opportunities for partnerships with other towns um, that could share a facility or other organizations that um, could work with the town to provide space for a facility need or provide funding while the town provides land, you know, scenarios like that where we can partner rather than um, do the whole facility on our own. And generally speaking, you know, a facilities plan can kind of manage expectations in terms of what the future holds for various department needs, for taxpayers, um, for the community in general. So I've already talked a lot about municipal facilities and I haven't told you what we mean by municipal facilities. Um, so in this report, what we're talking about here are municipal buildings, municipal structures, parks, um, other kind of bricks and mortar type facilities. What we're not talking about is we're not talking about road improvements or new sidewalks or you know infrastructure. We're talking about buildings and facilities that occupy people, that occupy um, equipment, that store equipment, things of that nature. And at this point, this facilities plan doesn't um, include the school department. As, as Tom mentioned, they have a similar facilities planning effort going on. We want the, the reports to come together and the planning to come together, but this doesn't, school, it doesn't include school needs or facilities at this point. So I list off you know, things that are in the needs assessment, so fire stations, library, community service buildings, things of that nature. That's what we're talking about. So really at the core of the planning process and the report is generating a needs assessment. And that's, that really is the foundation from which um, we go into timing and cost and those other things. And so this, this report and this plan takes a lot of cues from past reports, uh, rightfully. Uh, the 2006 comprehensive plan included a pretty thorough public facilities section. 
that identified needs um, 10 years ago. So that was taken into account. There was a growth in services report done in the late 90s, early 2000s that also was used as a reference document. And there's been some past proposals in the last 10 or 15 years for new facilities that haven't moved forward yet. And those are a foundation for this assessment, uh, a public safety expansion or new building, uh, a library expansion, senior center projects. Those all have been uh, mentioned and, and many of them have gone to, a few of them have gone to the voters. Um, so those are in this report and provide some of the background. To be current though, we got a lot of input, as Tom mentioned, and a lot of discussion with department heads, town administration, around what are the current needs. You know, things have changed in the last 10 years. Um, so what are the current needs? And department heads know day-to-day -day operations, um, space needs, equipment, storage needs, uh, things of that nature. They also have a sense for what they hear from the public. So that got entered into uh, this assessment. The Long Range Planning Committee also participated to provide some oversight as to how the report should be organized and what um, what we are including in it and, and really um, the flow of the document. So they participated as well. And this needs assessment tries to categorize needs by timeline. So there's short, medium, long term that are included and short term is roughly characterized as one to five years in this uh, draft report, medium term is five to 15 years, you know, and these don't have firm edges. These are general generalizations and longer term is, is 10 to 25 years. And we figure after 25 years, um, it's, we're really guessing at that point. So we didn't go beyond that. So the needs assessment, like I said, used a lot of background information and, and input from department heads and there's a, there's a range of things in here. Um, some may call them needs, other folks may call them wants or desires. So we acknowledge that up front. You know, there's categories here where there are some specific, <coughs> excuse me, definitive short-term like space needs, operational needs, and there's in some cases required facility upgrades. Um, so we, these are kind of the category of essential type improvements. Uh, an example of a required upgrade is right now Public Works is required to um, remove the existing fueling station for the school department and install a new one. That's an environmental requirement. So that's in this plan. That's not something we can <coughs> put off five or ten years. Um, so we're, that's an essential improvement, a required improvement. The IT department has server space and room needs. and it, in the short term needs to make a decision on how to accommodate new servers and upgrades. So that's an example of really a, a required or a fairly definitive improvement. <coughs> There's also projected medium and longer term needs. You know, these are based on trends, they're projected. Like we project that based on our growth, fire station in North Scarborough might need to be expanded given the growth in that area of town and the growth in Gorham and Westbrook in close proximity to that area of town. So that's not a short-term need, but it's a, it's a likely projected um, medium-term need. And then there are needs or desires that, uh, that we perceive the public and constituents will want, may want, uh, et cetera. Examples of that might be a senior center or a community center. The town can operate without both of those, but as the town grows, there's in different demographics, different constituent groups, an increasing interest in things like that. So we included that in the plan, not because it has to happen, but we should be thinking about it in terms of how it relates to, to other projects. Another key piece that we spent a lot of time on in the plan in terms of recommendations and thinking about is what are opportunities that we can take advantage of or what are partnerships that we can take advantage of? So uh, the plan in draft form suggests that there be a lot of time spent on um, being opportunistic. If there's a facility going in, what other departments can go into that or what other needs can be met in that one facility versus expanding another facility or doing another project a few years later. So being opportunistic is key. 
or we think is, is key, and, and that can result in being cost effective and avoiding um, duplicative costs and addressing multiple things at the same time. Um, partnerships, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, and the plan talks a lot about ideas around partnerships where maybe the town just provides land and a, a private entity comes in and, and does a facility the town benefits from. Um, the North Scarborough Fire Station is in the plan as a medium-term need potentially to expand, but not just to ser serve Scarborough. So there could be public partnership money coming from Gorham or Westbrook to help pay for that expansion. And because we might be housing emergency response vehicles from those other communities. <coughs> Another opportunity that can exist is examining the reuse of properties. If a facility is closed because a new one's built, whether it's a school facility or a town facility, what are the reuse potentials of that property to, to meet other needs? And then also the need to do kind of land planning and town campus planning. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and what kind of opportunities exist there. To, to get some edges around costs, uh, we did do a cost estimating exercise. I mentioned uh, Barry of Water and Curran, that was a key role that they played. And um, so taking the needs assessment, the report takes each of those facility needs or ideas and, as, and then generated cost estimates for those, uh, those facilities. Those are intended to be general, um, sort of orders of magnitude, not specific cost estimates. And they're generally, um, most facilities are based on square footage costs and also sort of project complexity um, where a fire department might fire, um, fire barn or public safety facility may be more complex and costly in terms of internal improvements versus, you know, a, a storage area for community services. So that factored into the cost estimating. Um, and they're based on sort of general industry standards, not getting into picking out specific, specific furnish, you know, specific items, which would be a later process. And these costs are kind of independent, they're exclusive of the idea of partnering and, you know, merging facilities in one building or, or in one facility, or excuse me, merging needs into one facility. Um, so the cost estimating is probably high in terms of the overall needs over the next 25 years because, again, they're independent cost estimates, not capitalizing on partnerships or collaboration or shared space, things of, things of that nature. So in terms of kind of key points um, and, and kind of going back to the reasons for the plan, this is intended to be very much a long-range facilities plan, you know, the one to 25 years out to, to help us pace when facility improvements should be made and, and to be proactive, not reactive to our needs. Um, it's intended to, to guide us in terms of being effective and opportunistic, as I mentioned earlier, um, to guide us on our use and allocation of town land, you know, really kind of maximizing the use of our town land um, where possible, to help manage our long-term debt service. Um, and at this point, the, the plan and report is, is just, just this point in time, so we <coughs> expect that it and it should be a, a fluid, flexible plan. You know, it's a starting point for the conversation as time goes on. Um, say a facility is upgraded or a new facility is, is built, we should, we should update the plan and, and let it be fluid. And community needs and desires are going to change. We should update the plan reflecting those. So this is really intended to be a starting point. I think the other key point, too, is that this is just a framework for how we think about prioritizing and moving forward in the next many years. Individual projects need their own committee. They need their own kind of detailed um, process. And in many cases, they're going to need, if not town council approval, um, voter approval. You know, there, there's projects in here that the council might be approving that are, you know, within your peer purview. There are other projects that are very likely um, going to need to be 
and should be approved town-wide um, by, by the voters. And so this, is, this plan is not presupposing anything. It's just laying out how we move forward with prioritizing and, and move forward with the framework. So in terms of next steps, as Tom mentioned, this is very much a draft. It's very much uh, a work in progress, and we've gotten to a point where we're really looking, wanted to present it, of course, and we're really looking for your feedback and direction on it. Um, we also look forward to collaborating with the school department on how these plans parallel each other or come together in some way um, with the school's facilities planning effort. Um, some additional next steps that are certainly needed is we need to better analyze our long-range debt service as it relates to the priorities here. That step hasn't been taken, so and that's in part why our time frames are short, medium, long. You know, we're not landing on particular years. Um, we're providing ranges to give guidance, and then the debt service and, and council feedback can help us start to nail things down in a more detailed way as we move forward. Um, as I mentioned earlier, any one or individual project that comes out of this larger planning process will have its own committee, have its own initiative, um, and that would be a future next step for, for any one facility. And I guess lastly, we're at some point as you provide feedback and, and if we take this from a draft to more of a final document, I know we're looking for council endorsement, council acceptance, to the extent that this can be a guiding document um, for next steps. So that's really what I have at this point, and i um, happy to answer questions, or if you have questions for, for Barry on cost estimating, he's here. Um, and I know some of the department heads are here too if you want to get into individual um, projects as well. I think the people will have questions, of Dan, and, and, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, this is new for us. Uh, uh, this is, as you can tell, terribly important. This is, this is a big deal. The town has been doing studies for the last decade and a half plus. Uh, a lot of those have been uh, put on hold because of economic conditions in the community. Uh, how we proceed, I think, is we need to all be comfortable with how that happens. Uh, uh, it's going to be a kind of a committee of the whole because we don't really have uh, any uh, subcommittee that this would be exactly perfect for. There's some things, I think we're obviously in education mode at the outset, uh, and everyone should feel very comfortable to input any questions about where are we going, what what do we need to know that we don't already know. Uh, it seems to me, uh, Tom and I were talking earlier today about the municipal bond piece, uh, and the finance committee I think is meeting next <coughs> Wednesday, the 9th, uh, to discuss municipal bond issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and this would be the sort of context to uh, have the Finance Committee take that up and other members of Town Council may wish to join in for that piece because that is, as Dan laid out uh, uh, at the beginning, one of the important pieces of information is how do you stage or stagger? Uh, and we don't have that information and this report didn't really attempt to identify that, so that lies uh, ahead of us. Uh, we obviously need to collectively make judgments about priorities. Uh, and, and so you're asking yourself, what are the highest needs of the community and how can we do it in the most cost-effective way? So uh, those, uh, and we've got a referendum circumstance uh, uh, for anything over $400,000. Uh, there'll be, if, when you think about the process, and Dan's laid out the committee, subcommittee, kind of ad hoc committees, just like what we're school <coughs> uh, It takes a long time. If you've been involved in a major project, like a public safety building, 
is uh, to get from the beginning to the end is easily three plus years if you're moving along vigorously. So uh, uh, when we think about, well, if we have an important need and we have it today, we're not going to fulfill it or respond to it for three to four years at a minimum, which kind of says, now that we have this work before us, we need to take it and do our job and do it uh, vigorously. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's and, and certain of these things are, are just self-evident. The fuel depot, the IT space, they all seem pretty clear. The public safety building has been the number one priority for the last dozen years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and anybody who's gone through the building, I know every one of us has gone through that building, has recognized how completely utilized all that space is, uh, with no uh, no real opportunity for growth. So, that's kind of the. I just wanted to lay out kind of the setting about that we ought to uh, approach this vigorously over the next several months. Mm -hmm. I think we can rely on the finance committee to do uh, a certain aspect of it. Otherwise. Uh, I think it'll be the seven of us working together. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure people have questions or comments, and Crystal, so with you. So I have three quick questions. The first one's more for, for Tom, I think. Um, who handles the maintenance, the facilities maintenance for each? Is it department-wise, like fire department handles the fire stations, police handles police, or is there like public works does the whole? The whole it's pretty much building by building. Building by building. Okay. By department by department. Okay. Um, the question for Dan. Um, when you're when you were looking through the priorities, were you taking into consideration maintenance costs in those rankings? Meaning, like uh, like say the town hall obviously is 30 plus years old, it might need a new roof, new boilers, new new you know. So the investment in keeping the facilities as they are is X. That helps us to decide: do we want new facility or renovate existing facility? You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Was there any consideration of the maintenance taken in, into the rankings at all? I think, I think certainly I think there's a factor in some of the high ranking, like the public safety building, and the chiefs can speak uh, more to that. It was a combination of space needs and um, existing and future maintenance needs. Um, so in the shorter range items, I think maintenance played a more prominent role than the mid to longer range items. The mid to longer range items are more a collection of needs that were just now emerging or that we anticipate will be emerging in the future that aren't at the tipping point that the short range items are today. Last question. Right, that kind of ties into the, um, were there any population or growth studies looked at to determine like West Scarborough needs a new fire station? Are we seeing trending population density trending or something that indicates yeah, that's probably going to come sooner rather than later, or are we not looking at that data so much right now? We're looking at it, but it's a little dated. I mean, we used the comprehensive plan from 2006 and some more recent updates, but I can't say it's, you know, 2015 um, growth scenarios for the community. So it's a mix of past projections and kind of anecdotal understanding, at least in terms of fire stations, because um, North Scarborough, fire station, and again, the chief is the expert on this. I'm um, um, not nearly as versed, but it's not just looking at the growth in North Scarborough. It's looking at the growth in South Gorham and Westbrook because it's a mutual aid um, building. So that that's a multi-town kind of growth projection, which, it, which is there. South Gorham is looking to grow, actually more than Scarborough is. Um, in longer range, there's the potential opportunity or need for like a West Scarborough fire station, but that's in question because actually growth has been reduced and we're now growing more on the eastern side of town, you know, more in, in our uh, central areas. So um, it played a factor and in, in helped inform some of these things. Yeah. Yeah, a little, little different tack, you know, kind of, kind of coming off the experience of last night as we're looking for a new superintendent for schools. It was actually a really great sort of input process or consensus building process right. of, of involving the community and saying, what is it you're looking for, what's important? So I hope it's part of this, and I really applaud this. This is great work that's been done. But at some point, sort of like we did for Higgins Beach, I'd love to see some type of process that as we go along to help with our work, that we ask the community, too, to weigh in on some of their priorities and where they are. I think it's going to be a real challenge 
over the next couple of years based on what's happening with school funding and what we see with school outlay. There's some tough choices <coughs> in the community, so I'd like us to think about a process that we build in that sort of community input to help to help grade the priorities of this that helps us frame that decision making. And then two, Tom, the said question I had is just, we talked about it on the phone, it would be great once we have this, once we have the school, to figure out what our peaks and valleys are to that load so we can make that, that tax rate as stable as we can so we plan the projects based on some of those debt retirement and other things. Yeah, we have that information now. We know when we'll be shedding significant debt such that we could theoretically take on additional debt. And I think the real goal is to manage that debt service as consistently and predictably as possible. So it's built into your operating budget. You really avoid those peaks and valleys. Um, I think the, the discussion next week with the Finance Committee will start that conversation. And it really ought to start, in my mind, with what's the level of comfort? How much debt is too much or how much, is, how much what's the right spot? Mm -hmm. And our financial advisor can help put that in context. I mean, the number, you know, we're hovering around $100 million in debt. That seems like a big, big number. And it would be, I think you'll be, you'll benefit from an outside perspective mm -hmm. putting that in context. Uh, what does it mean? Is, are those ratios too much for us to bear? And that will therefore, I think, help inform what is our capacity going forward. <clears throat> and when we're talking about debt, we have to remember that we have consistently had four or five million dollars in capital uh, improvements, uh, buying a bus on an annual basis, doing a road project. That doesn't go away. Right. So, uh, so that has to be taken into account. Correct. So that was actually <coughs> leads into the question that I had. Is that I know that we uh, specifically didn't bring into to some of the infrastructure and some of those particular costs, but I'm wondering if if maybe looking at those. I mean, we do know you know we have aging coolers on top of buildings or, or uh, bridges and, and roadways, and I'm wondering if, if I don't know if that fits better into a comprehensive plan or if, or do we have kind of a I think an infrastructure specific similar study is, is a good idea. So. Again, we can assess uh, other needs. We tried to stay specific to the kind of the bricks and mortar for, for this purpose, but I, your point's well taken. Dan, do you want to speak to the question of studying long-term infrastructure needs? Yeah, I mean, to Tom's response, we certainly can do that. I mean, right now, Public Works looks out five years for their capital planning, and it's part of your budget process. So every every fiscal year, they're updating, okay, these are in our one, two, three, four, five year projects. So we have this in more of a microcosm right now for at least public works infrastructure projects. But um, looking beyond that is, is important as well in getting into the five to 15 year horizon in terms of <coughs> transportation needs or utility extensions, things of that nature. So, um, and that, you know, maybe that's an element of the comprehensive plan update or, you know, is bundled with another broader initiative because that's often coupled with where's the town growing, where's the, <coughs> our infrastructure stressed. So that, that might be a natural um, time to be looking at those, that end of the um, facility spectrum. Our population growth uh, uh, is population growth data. Uh, adequate as it's available now, or do we need to study that further to understand our long-range needs? Well, we know we history informs the future pretty well, um, and we continue to be top four in terms of growth in Southern Maine and mm -hmm. probably Maine. So we're um, and that's not abating, at least residentially. Um, okay. Commercially, I think we're, we're probably similar. So um, we have fairly current population statistics, and, and of course we have permit data to the, to the data. <coughs> but we have the statistics to extrapolate that and, 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 and do some projections, and we have um, you know, some new trends in terms of the type of development we're seeing that can inform Inform our infrastructure needs. So, well, but how does this compare to the comprehensive plan? I mean, I assume comprehensive plan would be more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, is this the kind of material that's in there? I, I'm not familiar with more closely. The comprehensive plan is looks at a much broader array of things, such as the capital needs, and so on. So, growth patterns, 
transportation, housing, it looks at all the different kind of aspects of um, community growth and development. This is looking at just a small sliver of that, like the town's municipal facilities and how that relates to past, current, and future growth. So, component, in fact, the current right. 2006 vintage uh, public facilities <coughs> chapter, if you will, of the comp plan is included at the end of that. So, the end. Yes. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, I've already had a couple of phone calls from people who actually looked at our agenda tonight Good. Um, and looked at these reports. And they, uh, you know, they they have concerns <coughs> about impact on taxes and whatever, which is, um, I, I, I agree that that's something we need to look at. Uh, I know that moving forward and looking, just looking at what's been laid out here, of course I'm um, on long range planning as liaison, so I'm familiar with, with some of this a little more than uh, you folks are, but that being said is really looking very closely at co-location as much as we can. And if you could combine what a building does as much as possible or and or make the architectural structure of the building such a way that over time it's easy to move walls, it's easy to move, you know, to make it uh, more flexible use. I, I would like to see um, as we move along uh, for these uh, various things. I, I'm just going to put in a plug for the police and fire station. Um, my husband's been in the fire department for old my daughter, she's 25. Um, and, uh, you know, I've spent some time over there, as have all of you, um, and that I see that as a, a huge need. So I'm going to definitely put forward into that. It's something that's an immediate need. And then, of course, if, if DEP is after us about these tanks and pumps, that's going to be uh, looked at sooner rather than later. But. Anyway, that's, I can just, I just have a little vision about, it. well, you, we could do this, and school department is there, and library, and, you know, whatever. And that's why this yeah. should be fluid. When yeah. Sometimes if one thing <coughs> happens, it creates an opportunity that wasn't even anticipated. Right. Yeah, I think the, the flexibility aspect is not only the potential for partnerships right. to come along, but also to move pieces around. Right. And, and use our space intelligently if we're going to add something right. uh, that it can meet more than just a single need. Right. Uh, I just think that's smart. I think smart we ought to be very smart, smart try to be very smart about this. Sean. Sure. A um, couple of uh, specific questions on the, on the narrative and data and then I have some comments. So starting on page five of the actual report, there's a, a table that starts with short term. Is, is that ranked in order of priority? No, we purposely avoided kind of assigning a, okay. a rank. So that means that also on page 17, that's not in priority either. 17 is really the budgetary kind of no. lows and highs. There's no priority to that. No. Okay. So um, the other question I had was uh, on one particular project. It indicates, um, I can't remember what page it was on. I think it's the very last, second to last. It includes the ice rink. My understanding is that that is pretty much, uh, for lack of dead, um, it's the ice is melted on that because um, the um, memorandum of understanding is expired. There's really no agreement. Is that, is that just because this was outdated? Well, we threw it in still an effort. Uh, I think there's still an effort. I I don't think it will come forward in the same in the, in the in exactly the same way that it was proposed to us. Okay, and we, we captured it here really perhaps to demonstrate the opportunity for partnership. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the kind of the, the responsible party is an outside party. So we thought it was important just to capture it. It's been a need that's come forward, and that's why it's here. And the reason why I emphasize this one in particular is because I'm sure that there are also advocates out there that would suggest there are other projects that are not included, um, including a uh, pool. So uh, that's why I wanted to understand if this was specific or if it was, and so I appreciate the, the explanation. Right. It's about the partnership. Um, <coughs> over, first of all, I just want to say to Tom, uh, this is the best presentation about long-range facilities planning that I think I've seen in 15 years. It's concise, um, it's specific, and it's succinct, and it gives true dollar, or at least some estimated dollar values around that so that we can start looking at um, how that is. 
Um, you know, the analysis that is mentioned, I think, in one of the slides around the, uh, the debt piece is extremely important. So I think that our finance committee meeting that's going to be talking about bond structures and, um, and indebtedness is going to be important. I just hope that it doesn't, um, um, what's the word? Uh, there aren't over expectations about that meeting because that's not going to talk about the tolerance of what the community might accept for the debt load no. that is needed to support no, all of these going to be kind so of this a, is a very piece just right. to kind of build the understanding of debt management policies. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and one of the things that um, is really important, this is step one, there's a piece missing and that is the schools because there needs to be the balance of understanding about what is needed across the board mm -hmm. because I think that you're probably looking at probably a, about just as much money on the school side, I would suspect, based on what at least on what I'm hearing, not 100% certain, but that's pretty significant. And trying to find that balance between uh, their needs, the whole municipal mm -hmm. side needs, um, is going to be very important. Um, the bigger piece, though, is that I, I'm a little nervous. I, I think this needs to move forward um, so that we can better understand it, so that we can um, get into the weeds a little bit. Um, I'm nervous about the data that might have been used to create some of this perception, and that's because the comprehensive plan is now outdated. You know, part of the comprehensive plan also projected student mm -hmm. enrollment would continue to increase throughout the entire 10-year plan, but yet we've seen the last three or four years in which it's declined, which plays a big deal into ball fields, community service needs, um, schools that might be coming forward, everything that's related to that. So I want to be careful. I think, if anything, this calls for a need to get the comprehensive plan committee started as yeah. soon as possible so that they can um, work together um, and kind of gel together. And then last is that I think that there needs to be um, a stronger conversation around synergies as Council Katarina talked about, you know, the synergy of services um, and really what role the council might play in kind of determining that, you know. Um, so as an example, you know, uh, I think one could argue, I mean, I've been around enough to have seen a lot of referendums. You know, um, I, there's always been this ru you know, rumor that town hall really um, would be just the municipal services side. The school department could move into the library. The library could build a new library that's connected with a community center. Um, and so you kind of see this kind of whirlwind of different ideas that can happen. The question I have is really what role will the community play in that synergy conversation versus the experts? Because I rely very he heavily on you to determine you being staff, mm -hmm. does that really work? Obviously, we're not going to put a community center into a fire station. Um, <laughs> you know, our, so some things are kind of obvious, some things might not be. So, you know, I'll be very interested in how that plays out um, because this is this is pretty expensive. Well, one thing that I do want to get some feedback, and I'll just put it out there, and you can get back to me later. But we did struggle with how to involve the public in this process, and, and ended up. With with uh, kind of this internal approach, let's first document what we as the paid professionals believe our needs will be. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't expect the public to have an appreciation for the need to expand a fire station or even public safety. So we thought it was important <coughs> to document it first. Mm -hmm. And I still struggle a bit as to how to reach out because I think what we'll get is a is a wish list in many respects, whether it's a swimming pool or it's not going to be kind of the nuts and bolts, tangible things that we need, we believe we need to continue to service our residents. Uh, yet it's an important part of the process. So uh, I struggle with and, and I look for input as to how we pull that piece of input into this. Well, a part of it is that uh, we want to disseminate as much of the information that we're all receiving as possible mm -hmm. because uh, it's true that uh, the public's not going to know whether or not we need mm -hmm. expanded IT space. Just not going to know it. Right. So uh, certain of these things, <coughs> but they they have an interest in knowing, well, what, what, how are you prioritizing things? And how are you staggering and staging things to make them uh, affordable in terms of a stable tax rate? Those are all very legitimate mm -hmm. kinds of questions. And that's the kind of input we should expect. Uh, but there is there is a lot of... Sure. Uh, it, it, like finally, you you all should be comforted, and the public should be comforted that all of this is there's checks and balances and backstops all the way. Um, none of this can happen without going yeah. through a budget process, uh, whether right. it's capital or operational. And most of the big stuff does require voter approval. And there's a whole lot of work that goes into before you even consider going to the public. Right. It's <coughs> foolish to go out prematurely on any one of these projects. Right. 
Jean Marie. Um, just the thought that came into my mind when you were talking about the public involvement was just as an example. Um, I think that the public, if the public saw what example the central public safety building looks like, they'd be like, that would make a few jaws draw. To be honest with you, I mean, so to the extent where we can, if we've got a situation like the public safety building, that we can allow a public tour or open house or something so that people can actually see. That's just one example of a way, because um, be the general public yeah. doesn't get in that building. That would be an important part of a strategy and a uh -huh. campaign to educate the public leading up to a public vote. Sure. Yeah. Peter. Yeah, I think Tom, we, we, talked, we talked a little bit about it last night, it came up on the the superintendent about how do we tell the story? I mean, one of our goals as, as a council is how do we have better communication skills? Mm -hmm. So how do we tell the story about these projects? And I think that's that's part of the process you're talking about. We right. talked about how are we going to tell the story about the budget that's coming up and the things that we're doing. So I think, <coughs> I, I don't have all the answers, but I think other towns have done it. There's probably some folks out there we can tap into. But I think it is, and it, it, it kind of ties into what you were suggesting. How do we tell the story? How, right. But I think we do, because if it does go to, to the vote, right. they're going to have to vote for these things. Right. So the more information, the more storytelling we can do, the better chance we have of moving this forward. Of them understanding. Yeah, so I think we need, that gets back to our goal, that we need to do a better job of communicating with our constituents about mm -hmm. what we're thinking, why we're thinking, mm -hmm. how we got, to sort of get to your point, how do we get to where we are. So it's the storytelling I think we mm -hmm. should, should focus on. Yeah, I, just to piggyback a little bit on Peter's, I mean, I think each one of these projects needs to stand on its own merits. Yep. Um, you know, we've got, um, we're, we have a, a representative form of government here, and we rely on staff to assess their needs and prioritize them. We then have to set the policy or the decision of how we move forward. Then, that's where the communication piece sets in. We have to justify why we've picked what we've picked and mm -hmm. how we've done it. So, I, I, I mean, I, I think... Um, I, I think it's good to, to keep the list fluid uh, because situations come up and change and you never know, but, but it's also good to kind of have a, for lack of a better word, a forced ranked priority of things. If we're looking at public works and we're all you know, in agreement based on what we know now just from the 50,000 foot level that that's the direction we're going to be moving in from a capital improvement project, mm -hmm. then we need to start really working through the details of that specific project because to, to Bill's point, it's a three to five year right. lead time minimum. Mm -hmm. And and I think I think setting the, the 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 procedural part of that communication part comes from doing studies like this and looking at different projects on a case by case. Mm -hmm. And I, I think once once we get that priority set in for us, then we communicate out and say, Okay, we're gonna have a public forum on right. on the public works building of input of, you know, what do you wanna see in it? How do you wanna uh, because all that plays into budget as well. I mean, we can, you can, in any project, you can do small and try and scale up. You could go big and then try and reduce. <coughs> I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to, to address that concern. Other questions? So I would just say to, to, to Peter's point about having the story and to Chris's point about having them stand on their merit, we, we kind of need the documentation. It doesn't have to be necessarily an event or an open house where we have kind of the public coming together, we kind of need to, to be able to make the case somewhere, whether it's on, right. you know, in, in writing to say, you know, these are the reasons why we need right. a new public safety building or why we need expanded server space. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where we're at. to that conversation, right. that's right, right. right. kind of prompts it all. I guess the other piece I'd like some input on at some point is the school is going on a parallel path. Uh, they took a much deeper dive. They hired architects and spent a lot of time understanding operational costs and um, and I think it made sense for what they were doing. Uh, their plan is likely, I've not seen it, is likely to be a, a quite a bit set up quite a bit differently. And I would hate, I think it may be difficult to simply incorporate their findings into this or vice versa, so it may make sense uh, to have one or the other as an appendix uh, or mm -hmm. an attachment to it, so it stands on its own. Um, you can read it cover to cover. Uh, I just fear that it might be difficult to extract pieces out yeah. to force it into another format and you'll lose something in that translation, but I, I fully appreciate that they need to be considered together. And I, I don't want to speak, I mean, I can address some of that a little bit. I, I don't want to speak to, I mean, the, the school's going to come forward with what they feel their needs are out of long-range facility planning and things like that, but um, I mean, obviously, they're looking at some of the things that I mentioned. That, that deep dive that, that they did initially 
centered around maintenance. So what they got out of that package was a full inventory of all the facilities in terms of equipment, infrastructure, roofing, interior walls, everything, along with a very detailed maintenance type of plan that Todd Jepson can go through and help evaluate his long-term equipment costs, saying, okay, the boiler at Blue Point, let's say, is 20 years old. Um, I'm putting X amount in there for maintenance. That's going to be my next capital improvement is going to be that boiler, not, not an HVAC system on Wentworth or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so there, was a, there was a purpose behind that deep dive, and, and that kind of went into my question a little bit earlier about do we have a centralized facilities management group or do we allow on, you know, rely on individual, individual facilities to, to kind of run their own facilities management type of thing. Maybe that's an area of consolidation or something we can look at and then manage that over, a, a, over the whole town. I don't, I don't know. It would be great to have a, a facilities director. Right. Tom, am I correct that uh, no matter which side uh, of the town it comes from, the municipal side or the school side, uh, eventually it runs through the town finance committee? Absolutely. Yep. So in terms of responsibility, yeah. Uh, while we oftentimes sort of stick on the municipal side of things, this demonstrates a circumstance where we are squarely put in the position of having to judge priorities. The only exception would be a citizens-led initiative to get a matter on the ballot, but that seems very <coughs> likely that there would be such a groundswell of interest in a project uh, that the council wouldn't do that themselves as opposed to forcing the citizens to get it on the ballot. That seems highly unlikely. Can you speak to the uh, where the school is in terms of... I think they're very close. I mean, I know they've held it back for three or four months, really uh, trying to better understand the student uh, population numbers. Mm -hmm. And that input has been received and I think now incorporated. So I, I think they're within a month or six weeks of, of releasing their piece. So we'd probably look to you to some guidance on how to incorporate, coordinate. And well, I think before it comes back to you, I'd like to see that and have better understanding how the two are married uh, <coughs> or somehow combined. I also think that's an issue that could come up in the joint finance because it is something that's that's um, you know covers both both sides. It's, it's a very clear form right. that right. we don't otherwise meet with the right. board of education. So it's, it is, it's actually just a very convenient form, even if it is a little bit broader <coughs> in terms of a project. But ultimately, capital improvements are going to go through you. Right. I will say the one piece that I've been able to glean from <coughs> conversations just in the hallway is that the other focus really was on the K-2 schools pr predominantly. I think because of the, these fluctuations in student population, I think they're going to take a bit of a step back, that their needs aren't quite as... Um, perhaps not as soon as, as I thought they might be. Uh, because I think, understandably, they need to get a better handle of where's that all going. Mm -hmm. um, they're not, they shouldn't make decisions on those K-2 schools until they get a very good sense of the, the student population projections. So the good news with that is I think their big needs are probably in that medium term is my hunch. We'll see. Uh, I'll be anxious to see what the report says. My understanding is they're also looking at different, different use formats um, and trying rather than looking at expansion or new facilities, um, perhaps looking at different arrangements or different shuffling around of different resources to see if they can mm -hmm. utilize areas that have excessive space in one building, let's say, but over capacity in another. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what that would look like. That's obviously up to them, but, that's, but it's along those lines. I know they're really, they're really very, very sensitive about coming in front of the council and the town looking for new facilities. And Wentworth is... It was a great project. It's it is a great project, and it's a great outcome. Um, but it's it's still very very fresh and very new. <laughs> so um, I'm not speaking for them. I mean, they may come, that may change. I don't know the details of what they're going to present. But I think we're everyone's sensitive to voter fatigue, and, and uh, I think if we insult the voters and go back to them without making our case, um, yeah. we'll get what we deserve. So yep. we've got to be very thoughtful, strategic, um, you know, in making those requests. So your input's welcome. Uh, uh, Tom will take a very strong leadership role in trying to <coughs> guide us forward on this, but it would be my intention that we very actively pursue it uh, in the months ahead. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you for your thank you. attention and, and input. Thank you. Okay, we'll adjourn for the moment.
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. <coughs> Katarina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Present. Uh, general public comments. Anyone wishing to uh, speak on any issue that's not on the agenda, please approach the podium and introduce yourself. I'm Marge DeSanctis, 54 Beach Ridge Road. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of going to Augusta and being at the uh, Natural Resources Council of Maine Citizen Action Day. And one of the things they talked about was the solid waste composting recycling issue, which I know we have a committee mm -hmm. working on. And they strongly advocated pay for throw, for throw or whatever that's called, mm -hmm. um, uh, amongst other things. But there are going to be grants that the town's going to be able to get to help with some of those things. So just kind of watch for that because it hasn't been passed yet, but it looked very promising. Thank you. Anyone else? Close general public uh, uh, minutes of February 17, 2016, regular meeting. Move, move approval. Second. Any comments or corrections? Suggested seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? Passed unanimously. Adjustments to the agenda. I don't believe there's no. any adjustments being sought. Treasurer's warrants I will sign at the conclusion of the meeting. Uh, order number 16-011, 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to Chapter 405, the zoning ordinance of the town of Scarborough, Maine, section Roman numeral 3, nonconformance, subsection C, to allow nonconforming structures to be elevated to meet floodplain requirements. Anyone wishing to uh, speak at the public hearing, please present yourself. Dan, do you want to uh, speak to this uh, to in, in the nature of an introduction to remind people the topic before us? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman Donovan. Uh, this was before the council, I think, a, a couple of meetings ago, um, and has since been to the planning board for their public hearing. They're required to have a public hearing and, and review this zoning amendment. Um, and the, the background behind it is um, it's, it's really a conflict that exists between two different ordinances that um, really pertain to our beach communities where there's a lot of non-conforming houses and structures in our beaches, particularly along uh, the shoreline. Um, they might be too close to a property line here or there or be uh, non-conforming in some way. And um, when the property owner goes to improve that structure. It could just be internal improvements. It could be an addition somewhere else on the building. Um, when you improve a, a building or structure that's in the flood zone, um, you're required to have it now meet uh, the current flood zone requirements, which typically includes elevating the structure um, to be more resilient to flooding. Um, so when there's a structure that's non-conforming under our zoning ordinance, um, simply elevating it to meet flooding requirements under a different ordinance actually triggers a variance process by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, so this zoning amendment would um, relieve those property owners of that variance process if they're simply elevating a building for the purposes of meeting the, the flood zone requirements and, and making their property no. Again, more resilient to flooding and also, for that matter, <coughs> lowering insurance rates and, and providing other benefits. Um, so that's the, the background and the reason behind it. It's, it's not to eliminate a variance process for, for properties or projects that are proposing other changes. It's, it's more uh, aimed at um, eliminating the variance process to meet the other ordinance requirement to, to meet the flood zone standards. Happy to answer questions if the council or public have any. Chris. Um, thanks, Dan. I didn't see anything on the zoning board, the public hearing for the zoning board in the, in the minutes. Were there any adjustments or changes or anything? For the, the planning board um, reviewed it, and they didn't have any concerns or, or comments okay. um, to provide onto the council. They, they had a, 
um, positive recommendation. Are they it's there. Yeah. They are there. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Okay. Sorry. My Probably problem. short. Cause <laughs> it's very short. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks. Other questions? <clears throat> I just have a comment. Um, I think that this is a great idea. Um, I know we've talked about it in Conservation Commission as well as mm -hmm. um, it having been discussed regarding you know zoning and, and planning. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense. It makes it easier, I think, for all parties involved to know exactly what we're dealing with and how to deal with it and not have to go through a ZBA process or anything else in order to, to have this work for them. Well, thank you. I, I just want to make sure that I understand it. So uh, I, f I believe that my understanding is that um, you're still limited by the, the, the height limits of the zone. You are. But you're allowed to, you just don't have to get a, go back to the, for a waiver. A variance. Just a variance. Yeah. Okay. There's still the upper threshold right. height limit that you need to comply with. Yeah. So you're not very, you're not getting a variance to go beyond the height limit in that p any particular zone it's in. Yeah. Gotcha. So I, I'm just curious, what, what happens if you have a, a structure that would, if you were to raise to the flood level, would exceed that height limit? Then that's, then you're only allowed to raise it to meet the flooding <coughs> requirement. So if you're raising it for other, you know, raising it for other reasons, you would still need to get a variance. Um, but if there's a structure that's already non-conforming into to height, um, then I think you could still elevate it to meet the, the flood. Well, so I guess my, my example would be if there was a, a structure that was conforming to height, but it was the floodplain requirement required it to then be raised above that, and it was a non-conforming building otherwise. Good question. Yeah. I'm not sure I <coughs> that one. <laughs> that might need a variance from yeah, the zoning. That would need a variance at that point. I think gotcha. so. I mean, uh, this isn't relieving them of the height limit. So if you're already com complying with the height limit and elevating is not going to have you go beyond the height limit, uh, I think you're fine. But if you're if that needs to go beyond the, the height limit, then you probably do need a variance from the zoning board on that. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions for Dan before we move to the pu uh, public hearing? None. Thank you, Dan. Uh, anyone wishing to address this matter uh, can approach the podium. Seeing no one, close the public hearing. What's your pleasure? Move approval. Second. Uh, discussion. Chris. So um, now that I've read the planning zone, <laughs> and I appreciate that. Um, I, I haven't heard anything from any constituents. Yeah. It hasn't changed since the first reading. I agreed with it in the first reading, so I don't see any reason not to move this forward. <coughs> Other comments? Seeing none, uh, close the debate and uh, all in favor. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, order number 16. 015 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the request for a new food handler's license from John Navarro, DBA uh, Bad Dog Deli, located at 680 U.S. Route 1. It's a pleasure. Move approval. Second. It's public hearing. Public hearing. Uh, anyone wishing to uh, address right. this matter yeah. uh, may approach the podium. No one. Close the public hearing. Uh, Dodi, any uh, uh, input on this? It's a change in ownership. Change in yeah. ownership. Oh. Good. Uh, comments? Anyone wishing to address this? Chris? I'm still advocating for samples. <laughs> 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 Nobody's listening to me. That's right. <laughs> Take a hand. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little slow. Yeah, we'll get a bad dog for you. <laughs> uh, okay, seeing none, uh, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, order 16-0167 p.m. public hearing and action on the request for a new massage establishment massage therapist license uh, from Stacy Laburn Chenard, located at 20 Muzzy Road. This is a public hearing. Uh, anyone wishing to address this matter may approach the podium. None. What's your pleasure? Move approval. Second. Comment. 
Tony, any input on nothing? Good. No comments? All in favor? Okay. Opposed? <coughs> it's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, old business, none at this time. New business, none at this time. Uh, Non-action items, nothing there. Moving to standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Chris, why don't we start at your place? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so energy hasn't met since the last time. However, there's um, a little bit of discussion back and forth about um, stickers that are going to go on the barrels and which format that we are um, going to go with, whether it's a, a pictogram kind of format or a list. Um, I'd be happy to share that with counselors as well to see if they had any input. Um, I think that's a good idea. Um, just because there, it's right now it's kind of being um, discussed back and forth a little bit amongst the committee members. Um, so I'd be happy to share that. I'll, I'll forward that along to everybody um, and, and welcome your input and can report that to the committee as well. Uh, school board side of things, um, the work they had a work, excuse me, held a workshop last week uh, where they invited the legislative contingent in to discuss um, basically an appeal to approve additional funding for education. Um, the results were a bit mixed. They were seemed to be divided amongst party lines, which is not unexpected. Um, however, uh, <coughs> I do think that it's incumbent on everybody in town to look at their where they stand on this issue and reach out to their representatives on both sides and and push for that funding because it's really going to have a negative impact on Scarborough if we <coughs> stay at the cut levels that we're at. So um, we also had the uh, privilege of sitting in on a um, discussion focus group last night for uh, the part of the superintendent search. It was open to uh, the town council and the um, business leaders, community business leaders. Um, very, uh, very impressed with Dr. De Benedictus's uh, approach. It was very, very thorough, very ar uh, articulate, very detailed, um, and we seemed to get quite a bit done and a lot of consensus built in a very short amount of time. So. Maybe we could steal some of his ideas for a workshop. It was, uh, I, I thought that went very, very well. And I'm looking forward to hearing input from the other focus groups to see how we fared and how we stacked up against them. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yep. Good evening, everybody. Uh, just two quick updates. The Transportation Committee did meet. Um, and there's a lot of talk. To actually, they've put forth some, some planning. At this point, it's in a planning stage, but looking for some improvements on the Pine Point Road. Um, that the DOT is doing some work on the bridge, but from sort of the bridge by Snow Canyon down to the intersection, um, they've, they've tried to incorporate some walking trails and some biking trails that's still kind of a work in progress that will be coming forth, and they're going to do some focus groups on it, but it looks like just a great solution, so that's, that's positive. Um, <coughs> there was a kind of report on some of the work they've done at Dustin Corner around trying to coordinate the lights and other things. And they've actually done some traffic studies and actually it's shown a pretty significant improvement in the traffic flow, which was all great information. Um, and then the other committee that I report back on, there's been some developments for the, for the sort of seniors advisory group. Um, the coordinator um, left a couple while, uh, you know, about several weeks ago, but we have hired a new coordinator, um, Cynthia Tobias. She started on Monday. She was with the Southern Maine Agency on Aging. Mm -hmm. On this Friday at 10 to 12 at Wentworth in room D124, she's going to be there. The public is welcome to stop by and just say hi. <coughs> Get to know her. Her, her title is going to be Seniors and Youth Program Coordinator. So welcome, Cynthia, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Katerina. Hey, you better get me before I start coughing again. <laughs> um, ordinance committee, it's been fairly quiet. We are very, we're very happy that transportation is looking at um, this Pine Point because that's been something that's been before ordinance for a couple of years and never quite gelled. But now that there's construction and this new planning mm -hmm. for that area, I think that will help immensely with parking problems down there. So I look forward to seeing uh, what comes out of that. Um, so we're, we've been pretty quiet lately. Uh, I went to the chamber meeting and uh, <coughs> Chief Moulton did a presentation on Operation Hope, which they found very interesting uh, as, as a group and I believe that they're discussing the possibility of possibly doing some sort of a 
donation or whatever towards Operation Hope, which would be good. Uh, Long-term planning, well, you guys got the report. <laughs> <laughs> we are also something that will probably be coming forward out of long-term planning. Well, not probably, it will. I should back that up. Is looking at, again, <clears throat> looking at a couple of other areas, zoning areas in town, and allowing developers to use the f current footprint that they have, but to add more uh, rental units, so to speak, by instead of having two bedroom units, maybe having one bedroom units, which I'm in favor of because it adds to some affordability and flexibility for people uh, who are either looking to move into town or downsizing. Uh, Conservation Commission will be meeting on the, I think it's the 14th. It's going to be a workshop prior to our regular 7 o'clock meeting to do with stormwater issues. Um, I would remind people that Conservation Commission meetings are always open to the public if you're interested in knowing what we're doing. Um, one of the things we've been working on for a while is um, um, sea level rise issues um, as well as um, there's going to be a, a workshop in April on composting that, they're spon that we're sponsoring. So I know there are a number of people in town who may be interested in that. Um, other than that, that's it for my committee report. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Uh, the Appointments Committee met tonight. Um, in the absence of uh, Councilor St. Clair, I sat in his chair, um, and we had two vacancies uh, to, for consideration. Um, the committee is recommending the appointment of uh, Mr. Charles Spanger for the Conservation Committee, excuse me, Conservation Commission, uh, for the uh, term that was vacated uh, that expires in 2016, um, and then uh, Mr. Michael Richard for uh, the second alternate position with the term to expire in 2018 for the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, SEDCO also met um, last week, um, excuse me, two weeks ago, um, and it was really a very short meeting with a, a quorum for only a short period of time, and they met to discuss their the budget proposal um, that they'll be making, submitting. Um, the uh, Historic Preservation Implementation Committee met last night. Um, they are in the process of um, revising um, the historic um, site list. Um, they're um, working on correcting some typos. Um, I think there's a deletion, but they're also interested in adding um, some additional sites of interest. They have some candidates, but they're uh, really interested in getting some um, public input. Um, in particular, they're interested in um, self-nominations by owners of um, possible uh, buildings of historic significance. So if you happen to uh, be the owner of such a building and are interested in having it um, added to the Scarborough list of uh, historic <coughs> buildings, please reach out to me or uh, the chair, uh, Craig Friedrich, um, and, or another member of the committee. Um, we are also planning or have begun the planning for a very modest dedication ceremony uh, for the uh, relocation, relocated Danish Arch, Danish Village Arch, which is now Memorial Park, and uh, we're hoping to do that in the later part of May. That's all I have. Councilor Beba. Uh, thank you. Um, just two committees to report on tonight. First, uh, library, I did attend my first meeting for the Library Board of Trustees, and uh, <clears throat> what an exciting group, uh, very interesting group. Um, just want to mention two items. One is that they would like to schedule an informational workshop. I believe that they will be or should have reached out to the chair just to talk about uh, their services and their long-range planning. Um, I did want to mention that they will be rolling out soon what is called the Little Free Library, which I think is pretty exciting if you're not familiar with it. Um, I, you can visit the uh, library to find out more, but pretty much what it is is that there's going to be these little tiny libraries that look like little wooden huts um, located in certain neighborhoods <coughs> in which you can um, both uh, borrow a book as well as loan a book so that people can come along and um, take one out and uh, return one. And uh, I think it's a pretty exciting idea um, that reaches the library into our local neighborhoods. So uh, good luck with them on that. And of course, uh, what seems to be taking up a majority of time <coughs> is um, at least a conversation at this point is around finance. Uh, First, the Council's Finance Committee meeting will be uh, meeting next week on Wednesday. Um, and the primary focus of that conversation um, is around our bonds, uh, particularly uh, municipal bonds. And 
how they are um, important to the community, how they're structured, uh, what purpose, and then uh, kind of uh, ties into the workshop conversation that we had tonight in the sense of uh, where are we going uh, with our bonds. Um, and then on Thursday um, at 2 o'clock, well, by the way, uh, the council finance is 4 o'clock, and the uh, joint one on Thursday is at 2 o'clock, and um, I don't, re I have to, I hate to admit it, but I can't remember exactly what's on the agenda. <laughs> I believe it's been it's a long week already. I believe it's the, uh, the EPRI, the report out for the... No, no that's the 24th. Oh, the, the glossary of terms. Oh, that's right. And okay. Yes, the okay. glossary of terms and um, some pre-planning around the forum. Yep. <coughs> right. And that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I did not have any uh, committee meetings, although I was away and perhaps explains the suntan, second only to Donald Trump's uh, tan. That's a orange. A little orange. <laughs> a little orange. Uh, so let's move on to the town manager's report. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> first and foremost, I appreciate your attention and uh, your input tonight and what might come in the coming days and weeks regarding a long-range facility plan. Uh, it is a bit daunting when you look at those numbers, but I think it's worse if we don't plan for it. So it's important that we start to have these conversations and find ways to meet community needs uh, in, me in a measured pace that we can all live with. Uh, so I do look <coughs> for input. I will make that document uh, easily available to the website so the members of the public can spend time and understand it as well. Um, the community engagement survey, and I haven't had a chance to catch up with Councillor Katarina. I was just looking at it. <laughs> uh, we do have 84 responses, and I'm inclined to maybe let it soak mm -hmm. for a little bit more. Yep. Uh, but uh, the great thing is it's done through our website, which is on a Google platform. There's analytics that are all associated with it, so it's very easy to kind of download and look very quickly kind of on a dashboard basis what those results are. So it's... Um, you know, it's doing exactly what I had intended, and I think uh, more responses will make it even better. Uh, budget preparation is certainly a focal point for myself and staff. Uh, I've got an internal deadline for staff for the end of the week to have their budgets to me. So I'll really be ramping up looking at their specific requests, uh, though I've been meeting with them right along uh, starting next week. Um, and just to elaborate on the Joint Finance Committee meeting, uh, not only will we talking about the glossary of terms, uh, fleshing that out further. We've also prepared some analysis on the capital versus operational budget items. Oh, that's right, that's right. Um, I think you'll find that to be right. quite instructive, and we've, I think, flagged some opportunities. Mm -hmm. But there's some consequence, and so that's part of the conversation. Um, I'm pleased to announce that EcoMaine is uh, doing their annual Eco Excellence Awards, they call it. So every member community has an opportunity to uh, put forward a group or an individual, and this year Scarborough Library will be recognized for their book sale um, in the hierarchy of uh, recycling. Uh, reuse is a pretty big part of it, and they actually reuse 20,000 books on an annual basis, so that takes all those books theoretically out of the waste stream. So we thought they were a worthy um, group to be recognized, and they will be so. Uh, at a uh, celebration on March 23rd at 11.30 at EcoMaine. The Scarborough Land Trust annual meeting is coming up uh, Wednesday, March 9th, 7 p.m. at Camp Ketcha for anyone who's interested. Uh, the speakers this year, I believe, are Stacey Brenner and John Bliss, who own and operate Broad Turn Farm, and a, really a series of thriving businesses out of that location. Also, Community Services is doing their fourth annual Passport Day this Saturday here at Town Hall from 9 to 3. So we'll be properly staffed and we're able to deal with, uh, in years past we've done dozens of passports on that day. So we, we try to do that once a year to make it as convenient as possible for folks. And lastly, with the blessing of Chairman Donovan, uh, two weeks from tonight at 6 p.m. before your next council meeting, <coughs> we'll be doing having the annual audit presentation from our auditor. Uh, you'll see at your places this evening, the audits are here, it's the town, the school, and the management comments as well. And uh, Mac Page representatives will be here and make that presentation to you. And it will be a joint workshop with the Board of Education just to be efficient. So with that, um, certainly pleased to answer the questions. When was the passport day, did you say? This Saturday, this Saturday. 9 to 3. And then the the workshop on is going to be you said joint with the school as well for their yes own. yes the auditors you know, provide that function to uh, to both 
elected bodies. Council member comments. Why don't we start at Councillor Beba? Thank you. Uh, just a couple of items. Uh, first, I really want to thank uh, the manager um, and his staff in particular um, for the workshop that we had earlier tonight. Um, if citizens, uh, hopefully they'll be able to see that. And it was a very, um, a very good and thorough presentation on long-range facility planning. On the municipal side, it, it did exclude um, uh, school needs, uh, school projections. Um, you know, it's the first long-range plan that um, was presented in my 15 years. Um, that was as comprehensive as it was, that provided cost estimates, a true narrative around what is needed, and I just want to say thank you. It's probably one of the, the most professional presentations I've seen, so I appreciate <coughs> the work that went into that. Um, it's going to hopefully drive a lot of conversations for many years, um, as well as um, items, but at the same time, I hope that people realize that this is a draft and it's a presentation to start the conversation. So um, I hope that we don't drum, dr jump to conclusions about uh, priorities as well as uh, what the total impact might be because we really haven't delved into that yet. Um, but sometimes information can drive speculation and um, we want to do this the right way. So I appreciate the work that was done and the work that we'll do. Um, I did want to mention, to throw a little politics into this, of course, because uh, as I said once before, many years ago, uh, uh, being on the town council is political from uh, um, who makes, um, uh, I'm sorry, who says the Pledge of Allegiance to actually who uh, makes the motion to adjourn. It's all political. But uh, I did want to mention <laughs> that the caucuses are this weekend for both the Democratic Party and the Republican mm -hmm. Party. The Democrats are meeting on Sunday, um, uh, which is March 6th at noon time. Is the door, I believe the doors are opening at Scarborough High School in the cafeteria. Um, do want to mention, I I'm pretty certain that, and Tony will correct me, but um, Unenrolled can actually enroll um, on site, but if you yeah. cannot change parties. Right. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. And then Saturday, the day before, on March 5th at 8.30 a.m., the Republicans are meeting actually at Westbrook High School. So uh, please participate. It's an incredibly important process, no matter what party you're in. You know, one of the things that I've done for the last 30 years is um, I've been lucky to participate with the American Legion's Boy State Program. Um, in which, uh, you know, I get to go once, uh, one week a year to teach young men um, the importance of participating and the responsibility that we have and what the veterans gave us, and this is an important part of that. So I really want to encourage everyone to go, as well as those who are 17 but yet may be turning 18 before the election, because I'm fairly certain they can participate. They can't with, vote. They cannot vote, but that... They can participate. Right. They can participate but cannot vote because they're not 18 yet. <coughs> So, uh, <clears throat> just uh, along party differences, if they are 18 at the at, by November, a regular election, they can participate in the Dems caucus. Yep. So that's a party. Uh, that's not a state thing. That's a party thing. Yep. So, yep. please participate, no matter what party. It's important. Um, Want to also uh, thank the uh, process. Last night, I also attended the superintendent's uh, search committee focus <coughs> group for business and community leaders. Very, very exciting. We had 12 members present uh, total, 12 people. And um, I think it's a testament um, to the conversation that happened about the, um, really the contribution of our business community. I mean, the five of us were counselors that were there, but it's really um, the balance that they also look for um, in this community uh, for their needs as well as the community's needs around education and other services. So uh, to the business leaders that did attend and participate, I do want to say thank you. It was very, very important. Um, and then also wanted to comment regarding the legislative meeting that the school board had. Um, you know, I, I did send an email in response. I wasn't able to attend the whole meeting. I came in late. Um, I hope that next year, I know that like last year, the, school, the town council had a meeting, um, and then the school board also had its own meeting this year. We weren't able to do that, but the school did. I hope that next year um, we might have one meeting that's more than an hour um, that really can get into the issues. Um, as well, and it's not just educational issues because there's solid waste issues that we're dealing mm -hmm. with. There's, um, there's a lot of issues that we need to understand better and maybe we can do and have, you know, a two or three hour meeting around that. Mm -hmm. I think what's important though is that even though I wasn't able to attend but have been able to listen to a lot of participants is that um, while there are a lot of differences in the room, it's, extreme, it's obvious, including the staff members that were there from both the school department as well as the state, that everyone cared. Um, about the conversation and about the impact that education has on Scarborough, but even also statewide, because we do think about our other communities. 
um, I think the differences that happened, and I don't think that anybody walked out of there surprised, is that um, we simply express ourselves in varying ways, and we have different priorities in which we set them. And so I hope that both the legislators will go to Augusta and understand what our points of view are around education um, and, and represent a little bit stronger about that because it is important, um, while we also respect the differences that may have been expressed during that meeting because that part is also important. Um, in the end of the day, um, the fact is that I'm not going to agree with any one of the legislators in there except for maybe one or two, and um, <laughs> that's just the way it is. And we're not going to change their mind. Um, that we're not going to change their mind, but I hope that they at least understand where we're coming from. So I do appreciate the work that they did because it is a lot of work, but we do it because we love it. And uh, with that, I um, just want to say thank you. How's the rolling? Um, <clears throat> so in, uh, I also wanted to thank the school board for uh, inviting us to the, um, the session last night discussing the um, superintendent's search. Um, I was also impressed with uh, Mr. De Benedictus. I think I'm saying that right. Um, and uh, I thought that was also incredibly productive. I was I was very impressed with um, um, with just the, the process that he went through. And I know that the uh, sc school department has also invited parents, and they're there tonight. Um, and uh, um, so hopefully that that's going well, also. And then uh, regarding the school board meeting last week with the uh, legislators, um, I think I just wanted to. Um, again, make the appeal to um, our legislators and, and senator uh, that are, are as yet not supportive of uh, additional funding for education, um, that we're really facing some uh, dire straits uh, here in Scarborough in terms of the, uh, the revenue shortfall that's going to fall to our property <coughs> taxpayer here in Scarborough unless the state comes up with additional um, funding to put into the um, general purpose allocation for education. Um, so I'm, um, uh, there was also a comment there um, about the percentage, and I just wanted to, to re-stress the fact that Scarborough would be the second largest beneficiary of any additional um, allocation from the legislature because of the, the way that those funds are distributed. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, um, I did know on the uh, superintendent focus group last night. I enjoyed that. It was great uh, listening to not only the five of us, um, but the business people who took the time to come and give some input on what they were looking for in a superintendent. Very well run and very productive. I also would like to thank uh, the manager for putting together this or helping us with putting this long-range plan for facilities and capital improvements because I, I do think that it goes a long way towards at least giving us a roadmap um, as to where we may want to end up. And I do want to emphasize, as Councilor Babine did, that this is this is just the first this is the first draft. Nothing's been settled. No one's spending any money yet. Uh, it's got to go through a long process, but at least we have a road map. Because yep. if you don't have a map with goals, uh, as they say, if you get in your car and you don't know where you're going, you're likely to end up anywhere. So I'd rather have some sort of a plan as to where we're going. Uh, I also would like to weigh in on the school board meeting last week. I was unable to m make it because I had a previous engagement. I did catch oh, the last oh, 40 minutes of it anyway on TV. And imagine my dismay that we still have members of the legislative delegation who I felt were not being very supportive of Scarborough. They were dancing all around, except for one. One was pretty clear about it was no. Um, a couple of others were dancing around whether they would support more monies. <clears throat> I, I will let people know that I got on the phone to uh, Senator Dawn Hill. She's the assistant minority leader. And she did call me back uh, the, that um, conformity with the uh, education money is coming out tomorrow in the Senate. <clears throat> she, the, I don't want to get on the whole sausage making that's going on up there, uh, but it, the, the plan is to try to put together a supermajority to overcome any veto. 
and that there will be some money for education, what it looks like, nobody knows. So that was the latest, and that was as of Monday. That's when I talked to Senator Hill. So just wanted to update people on that. And I, I encourage people, you know, I encourage people to reach out to me when they're not happy or if they're happy. I like it better when it's happy, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, and I certainly encourage people to reach out to their legislators just to let them know your thoughts on where and how money's going to come. Because we all pay income tax, we all pay excise taxes, we all pay sales taxes and whatever. It goes up to Augusta and personally I'd like to see some of it come back so that our property taxes are more stable um, in this town. But that's my soapbox for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I guess I'll kind of piggyback on a lot of what's been said. I guess I'll go on a different soapbox. <laughs> um, but I do. I, I attended the superintendent thing last night, and I felt walked away thinking, you know, we had pledged as a community and as a council that we really wanted to have a much different process this year for the budget and how we move forward and how we acted. And last night really felt like it really was an attempt at collaboration. It really felt like we were listened to as what we thought was important in traits and characteristics of the next superintendent of school. That felt collaborative. It felt respectful. And then I kind of compare and contrast. I did attend the legislature. And I think, setting that aside, we're going to have, a, as you've heard tonight, with what we're facing in the long-range plan, we haven't seen the school's proposals yet, this community is going to have some really, really tough choices to make. And I just make a pledge. We have to find a way that we can at least listen civilly, respect the other person, and find a way we can somehow to come to some consensus on what we're going to do. And I've just taken a page off the national stage. When you look at the national discourse now, it is not even <laughs> civil. It's disrespectful. We yeah. can do something different. And, and you know, yeah. I, I've said it before, the mm -hmm. kindness project. I hope we can really leverage that. This community has got to have some tough conversations and we got to do it divorced of politics and ideology and all this other stuff. We got to do what's right for Scarborough. So I just pledge to everybody, be patient with everybody else, listen and let's find a pathway forward. Councilor Kazo. So I haven't forgotten my promise from the last council meeting to be extra kind and be very short. <laughs> so I will say, um, I will concur with uh, the comments of my fellow councilors, but I did want to say that I think it is critical for the, the citizens of Scarborough to reach out to their representatives and make their opinions known. Uh, they represent us. They don't represent um, anybody else except the, the town of Scarborough who elects them, and they need to hear from you. And whether you agree with them or disagree with them, they need to hear that too. So mm -hmm. I will just simply state my appeal that um, the people sitting before you tonight uh, certainly do everything we possibly can with what we're handed, um, but a little bit of help will go a long way. And it doesn't need to be fully reinstated, but even a little bit of funding is going to take some of the sting out. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Um, for those uh, watching from home, we have launched a long-range planning facilities uh, process this evening uh, with the workshop. <coughs> it's on Channel 3. Uh, I really encourage people to take the opportunity to watch it. Uh, it's a good discussion. The report uh, is going to be on our website, uh, uh, and this will be a very active process in the months ahead. Uh, we will try to keep all of the counselors updated on the progress we make on the trash uh, uh, report. There were obviously a number of things that are both economical and potentially effective, and the town manager and I will report on those uh, every single meeting. Um, the uh, legislature has before it a proposal to add money to the school funding. Uh, Scarborough is in a very, very difficult position if some additional funds are not added. We will be in a position where we are cutting services uh, or raising taxes and probably both. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a very serious, very difficult moment 
for us, uh, it's the consequence of a formula that does not seem to treat us very well. Uh, we've had very minor changes in our enrollment and in our assessed values, but yet it seems to have a very significant impact under this formula that's applied for distributing state uh, education aid. Uh, but most of the money is the underfunding by the state. Mm -hmm. The state underfunds what its legal obligation is of 55 percent uh, uh, of the total cost of schooling uh, in Maine, uh, and that uh, that's the third wheel of this very difficult situation. And I join the others who said, put partisan viewpoints aside, find solutions, cooperate because that's really how we're trying to conduct our affairs here uh, uh, for the town of Scarborough, and we really hope that uh, uh, our representatives can do the same. Uh, I think that probably, I, well, I think when we next meet, we'll all have an idea what <coughs> Lord Grantham and his family are, uh, 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 will have done for a future. So uh, I'll ask for a uh, vote to adjourn. <coughs> Second. All in favor. No, I'm not. <laughs>